Let's talk about technical communication. This is universally one of the biggest challenges that data scientists face. However, it also presents one of the greatest opportunities. Here I'm going to discuss the seven tips that have been most helpful to me in becoming a more effective communicator. You might be thinking, Shah, I'm a data scientist. My job is to code and build AIs and understand statistics. Why do I need to be an effective communicator? Can I just leave that to the business folks? Of course, this is a narrow perspective, because in most business contexts, the way data scientists create value is not through writing code or building AIs, but rather through solving problems. And the problems that they solve aren't their own problems, but they are the problems of stakeholders or clients. So in order to effectively solve these problems, the data scientist must be able to effectively communicate with the stakeholders. This highlights the point that it doesn't matter how powerful your AI is or how impressive your analysis is, if you can't effectively convey these things to these stakeholders, they're never actually going to be used to solve the problem. This presents a key bottleneck. Most of the time, data scientists aren't limited by their technical ability, but rather their ability to effectively communicate with stakeholders and clients. And when I was working at a big enterprise, this was one of the biggest factors that would hold back data data scientists from advancing. So if you want to make greater impact, you want to drive more value, and you want to get those promotions, improving your communication is one of the best ways to do that as a data scientist. Some might think that communication is an innate skill, meaning that it's either something you're good at or you're not good at. And this, of course, is false. Communication, like any other skill, is something that needs to be developed through practice. And I am living proof of that, where five years ago, I was an overly technical physics grad student who probably spent too much time in the lab. But after five years of dedicated effort, I now get invited to do public speaking events. My YouTube videos have been viewed over 1 million times, which is just a mind boggling number to me. And my Medium articles have been read over 300,000 times. All that to say, if this guy can do it, you can too. And so here I'm going to share the top seven communication tips that have helped me over these past five years. The first is to use stories. The second is to use examples. Third, use analogies. The fourth is structuring information as numbered lists. Fifth is always following the principle of less is more. Six is to show rather than tell. And the seventh and final one is to slow down. So let's talk about these one by one. The first tip is to use stories. This is something I picked up from a book called The Storyteller's Secret. There the author describes how our brains are wired for stories. Stories just make sense to us and they are one of the most powerful tools we can use to communicate information effectively. And when I say story here, I don't mean something like a news article or a novel, but rather any three part narrative. Some examples of that include status quo problem solution. This is my go-to storytelling format, and you'll see this throughout my Medium articles, my YouTube videos, and LinkedIn posts. Let's see a concrete example of this. AI has taken the business world by storm. While its potential is clear, translating it into specific value-generating business applications remains a challenge. Here I discuss five AI success stories to help guide its development in your business. Another structure I like is the what, why, and how. And I actually used this to structure this talk. I started with the high level technical communication. I talked about why it mattered. Then I dove into the how, which are these seven tips. Another structure I like is the what, so what, and what now. So in a business context, what this might look like is website traffic is down 25%. This has led to a 150,000 revenue drop. The analytics team is investigating the root cause. This is a natural way to structure information. For instance, imagine if we didn't use a story here and we said something like the analytics team is investigating the root cause of website traffic being down 25% and revenue dropping $150,000. It doesn't really have the same flow and ring to it. It kind of feels like a barrage of information. However, structuring it into this three-part narrative makes it a bit more digestible and ends the communication on a positive note. The next tip is to use examples. Examples are powerful because they ground abstract 
abstract ideas with concrete examples. What this might look like in practice is you might get a ping from a stakeholder asking you what's a feature because maybe you mentioned it three times in an email to them, to which you could say features are things we use to make predictions. While this answers the question, it's still a pretty abstract statement. And so an easy way to make this more clear is to add something like, for example, the features of our customer churn model include age of account and number of logins in the past 90 days. This allows the other side to connect this abstract idea to a specific example to which they might respond with a heart emoji. A related idea to using examples is to use analogies. Analogies are powerful because they map the unfamiliar to the familiar. For example, the word algorithm is unfamiliar to many people. However, the word recipe is very familiar. Almost everyone has followed a recipe before. Another example is a feature to which you could make the analogy to an ingredient in a recipe. An analogy I used in my fine tuning video was comparing fine tuning to turning a raw diamond into a diamond that you'd actually put on a diamond ring. The next tip is to use numbered lists, which is what I'm doing in listing out these seven communication tips. And the power of numbered lists is that numbers tend to stick out to us, especially when trying to navigate an ocean of words and language. This is something that really hit me when I read the great book by the late Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow, where he framed these two systems of the mind. So what people might call the conscious or the subconscious or the automatic thinking system and the deliberate thinking system, he simply called them system one and system two. These labels really stuck with me and consequently I started using this strategy throughout my content creation. Some examples are in my fine tuning content, I talk about three ways to fine tune. In my LLM intro, I talked about three levels of using LLMs. My causal discovery video, I talked about three tricks for causal discovery. When listing takeaways, I'll often add a number to them, like my four key takeaways or my three takeaways. And in my causal inference blog, I talked about the three gifts of causal inference. And then these will be followed up by listings like we're seeing in this article where it's like tip one, tip two, tip three. This way of structuring information tends to make it a bit more digestible for the audience. The fifth tip is less is more, which is the fundamental principle of all types of communication. What really convinced me of the power of less is more is work again from Daniel Kahneman in his capacity theory, whose basic premise is our attention and ability to exert mental effort is limited. Applying that to a communication context, your audience's attention is finite. So it is important that you be very economical in how you spend your audience's attention. Do you want to spend it on small talk and fluff or do you want to spend it on key information? And while you might think having less things on your slides or using less words in an email should take less time, the exact opposite is usually the case. And this is captured well by the famous quote from Mark Twain, which goes, I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. A related idea to less is more is to show, don't tell. And the basic idea here is to use pictures over words at every opportunity. To demonstrate this, let's look at the fine tuning analogy I made on a previous slide. Fine tuning is when we take an existing model and refine it for a particular use case. This is like taking a raw diamond base model and transforming it into a diamond we can put on a diamond ring, fine tuned model. While it's good we used an analogy, this is a lot of work and mental effort our audience needs to expend to get this information. So let's see what this could look like through images. This is a slide from my fine tuning video and it conveys the point much more concisely. We have an ugly raw diamond here and it becomes a very beautiful diamond here and these things are labeled by base model and fine tune model. The seventh and final tip is to slow down. This was another tip that had a significant impact on my communication skills. Before I had a tendency to rush through talks, typically because I was nervous and I didn't want to waste the audience's time. But the thing about a rush talk is that from the audience's perspective, it feels like getting blasted in the face with a fire hose and it doesn't leave anyone very happy. It's painful to listen to and it's hard to digest the information. On the other hand, a well-paced talk is like a soothing stream that is easy to digest and leaves the audience like this. The irony of it all is that a rush talk, even if it takes 
takes less time is more draining than a well-paced talk that might be an extra three to five minutes, which might leave the audience energized and excited to ask questions. I'll also throw in a bonus tip, which is to know thy audience. Knowing your audience allows you to effectively frame all aspects of your communication. So what this might look like in practice is if I'm explaining a new AI project to someone in the C-suite, I'll use terms like AI. However, if I'm talking to a BI analyst who has a bit more hands-on experience with generative AI, I might use the term LLM. While if I'm talking to a fellow data scientist, I might be more specific and say the specific model that is being used in the project, like Llama 3 8B. However, this isn't just about using the right terminology when talking to your audience. Different audiences care about different things. So if you're talking to someone in the C-suite, you often want to focus on the what and the why. Leave the conversation at a relatively high level, focusing on the business impact. If talking to a BI analyst, you still want to discuss the what and the why, However, you might give more technical details. And in addition to the business impact, you might talk about the relevance of the project to their specific workflow. Finally, if talking to a fellow data scientist, you would talk about the what, why, but also the how. So this might include all the nitty gritty technical details. You still wanna talk about business impact because everyone wants to know the why. They want to know how their effort fits into the bigger picture. The key difference, however, is that you might be talking about the how, the specific implementation steps for the project. So that brings us to the end. If you enjoyed this video and you want to learn more, check out the blog posted on Medium. And as always, thank you so much for your time and thanks for watching.